Today we're having a look at two outstanding zoom lenses for your APS-C cameras and Sony FX30 in particular. Tamron 17-70 f2.8 VC, so with stabilization, versus Sigma 18-50 f2.8, a little nice and sharp lens. So let's get to the comparison. What's good guys, my name is Oleg Nikitin, you're watching No Limits On channel. So those two lenses are a great option, a fast option for your APS-C cameras. Of course, f2.8 is not that fast as Sigma 18-35 f1.8 for instance, but still f2.8 is plenty bright for the APS-C sensor. So let's get to the comparison and the first thing you notice is that the size difference is huge and the weight as well. So guys, the size difference, even when you are at the widest end and the lenses are not extended, is still pretty significant. I can say that Sigma is almost twice as short as the Tamron lens, and when you extend the barrel, so you get to the telephoto end, it gets even bigger. I mean, the difference gets even bigger. And here is a little sample I made so you can understand how much bigger the Tamron is, both on wide end and on the telephoto end as well. And also, guys, the price difference is $150, so the Tamron is $700, and the Sigma is 550. So now guys, let's talk about the difference in terms of focal length, 17 millimeters versus 18 millimeters. So here are 17 millimeters and here are 18 millimeters on the Sigma. As you can see, the difference is not that huge. So here is 70 millimeter on the Tamron lens and it's getting pretty good bokeh. And here I am standing in the same spot, but with Sigma at 50 millimeter. Not a huge difference once again, here are they side by side. You do get a lot more bokeh with a 70mm f2.8 on the Tamron lens, but still it's more than fine, at least to me, with the Sigma. So let's walk through the whole range, so from the widest end to the uh, most telephoto, and here is the difference on the wide end. Now we get to the most telephoto, focal length, 50 on the Sigma and 70 on the Tamron, and here is the difference, it's the closest to the edge part of the frame, and here we get clear image zoom which can get us even closer with the Tamron lens, but Sigma is getting almost exactly the same focal length as the, as the Tamron optically if you get and if you engage the clear image zoom. And here is the difference between 50 and 70 millimeter, so it's more obvious to you. So now let's check the autofocus of those two lenses. As you can see, I have recorded the screen as well, and we have the fastest sensitivity and speed tracking. So let's have a look at the Tamron. The Tamron does okay in terms of tracking when I get forward and backwards, and when I get down, I can see a little jitter in the Tamron footage. It kind of hunts a little bit back and forth, and here is the hand test. As you can see, we get just a tiny bit of hunting. The same test with the Sigma, once again, when you do tracking, so you get back and forth, it's doing a great job, no lag whatsoever, Sony FX30 is doing a great job as well. But here you can see that Sigma simply grabs the foreground when I get out of the shot. So all in all, I do prefer Sigma, but both lenses perform okay, in my opinion. Sigma is a touch better. And here we are at 50mm with the Tamron lens, so just a fair comparison in terms of focal length. And it's doing a great job at 50mm, it's also grabbing the shot straight away, no pulsing, no hunting whatsoever, so at 50mm Tamron is doing a better job than at the widest angle. And now let's have a look at the Sigma lens. As you can tell guys, Sigma also tracks my eye perfectly fine, and when I get back and forth, even if I run towards the camera, it's always in focus, which is great. So now let me get down from the shot, and once again, instant in focus. I get back, instant in focus. The hand test, everything, just flawless performance, and I'm really satisfied with both lenses in terms of autofocus. One more interesting factor, guys, is when we zoom in or zoom out, how autofocus works in this circumstance, how it loses the focus when you zoom in and out, or how it doesn't lose focus. And Sigma shows pretty good results right here, so let's check the Tamron lens. And here is the Tamron, guys, and as you can see, it loses autofocus, I mean, it loses focus when you zoom in or zoom out rapidly. So in this regard, Sigma shows better results. So if you do a lot of zoom in, zoom out like Quentin Tarantino style, 
the Sigma is going to be better. So now guys, let's have a look at the flares performance. So here is the Tamron at 17 mm, wide open f2.8. And as the sun gets into the shot, we do lose a little bit of contrast and we see those little flares, kind of sun reflections, if you will. And all in all, it's a decent performance, not the best one. And the Sigma on the widest end at 18 mm f2.8 is also showing kind of similar performance. We also do lose a little bit of contrast. But all in all, it's an okay, I would say, average performance. When we zoom into 70mm on the Tamron, we do get much bigger flares and a lot more, uh, a lot less actually contrast. So as you can tell, guys, the Tamron is not the best in terms of flares. So be careful while shooting in the, with the backlighting. Sigma does almost the same. I would say they are more or less on par on the telephoto end when it comes to flares. So beware. And you should know that you do lose a ton of contrast, especially on the telephoto end when you use those two lenses with the backlighting, of course. So now, guys, let's have a look at the minimum focus and distance. As you can tell, Sigma can focus a bit closer than the Tamron on the wide end. But unfortunately, guys, the image quality is not the best. You can see a lot of ghosting. The contrast is not the best. And we have to stop down the lens to get better performance. So let's have a look. Here is F4 and it does look much better. But I would prefer to shoot at f5.6 with the minimal focus and distance on both lenses. Because it's just the way the lenses work. With the minimum focus and distance, almost no lens has the perfect image quality. Only the most expensive ones. So if you do want to use like minimum focus and distance a lot, please stop down with your lens, any of those lenses. So now let's check how close you can get with my finger. Uh, so here it is, 12 centimeters on the Sigma and 19 centimeters on the Tamron from the flange distance of the camera. So it counts somewhere from here. Here it is, the flange distance, and it counts from here. So 12 centimeters from here is like so. So it's super small minimum focus and distance. And as you can tell, Sigma gets you a lot closer. It reminds me of the iPhone ultra wide camera with its macro capabilities, like on the 13 Pro Max or 14 Pro Max. It's pretty fun to use this micro mode. But here we have the 50mm versus 70mm on those two lenses. And as you can tell, the image quality is not perfect. We see some ghosting, we see blurry edges and chromatic aberrations, those purple-ish and greenish tints. So we have to stop down. So here it is at f2.8. Let's stop it down to f4. It's getting better, but still not perfect. I can still see the chromatic aberrations. 5.6 looks great on Sigma, but not perfect on Tamron, so keep that in mind, guys, when you shoot with a minimum focus and distance. So now, guys, let's have a look at focus breathing. If you shoot video, you should know about this in every lens. So here's the Sigma at 18mm and f11, and as you can see, when I rec focus, the image almost stays the same in terms of scale. It doesn't zoom in or zoom out, so I can say that it's almost no focus breathing here. Great performance. Tamron also doesn't have any focus breathing, as far as I can tell, with the wide angle uh, format at 17 mm f11, I don't see any major issues with focus breathing. Sigma at 50 mm looks like it has almost zero focus breathing one more time. So all in all, it's a great lens to use with video features and to rack focus. And here is the Tamron at 50 mm as well, f11. Mm, a little bit of focus breathing, just a touch, but nothing too crazy, guys. So let me tell you about the focus racking with those two lenses in manual mode. So when I rack focus in manual focus with the Tamron, it gets really fast. So you turn it a little bit and the image focuses, I mean the lens focuses a lot. Uh, and I don't really like the way it um, focuses because it does it in kind of steps. So it's a bit jerky. With the Sigma, it's also not perfect because it's too slow. So if you want to get from one meter to like infinity, you can rotate and rotate and rotate this ring a lot, but it's much more smooth. So if you do little focus pulls, like um, you try to keep the subject in focus when it's, I don't know, maybe a person does an interview and you try to rec focus manually for some reason, you will do a better job with the Sigma lens. Just keep that in mind, guys. So the next test is about stabilization. Uh, I do use Sony FX30, which does have IBIS, so you know, basically the sensor is stabilized, and the Tamron lens also does have in, built-in image stabilization, which is called VC, or vibration control, or vibration compensation, I'm not really sure about it. So, I thought, when I was picking the Sony FX30 and this Tamron lens, because I do own this lens, 
that those two stabilizations would uh, pair, they would work together. But I found out that it's not the case because the stabilization here kind of fights against the IBIS in my Sony FX30 and a lot of my colleagues are having the same issues with this combination of camera and lens. So the Tamron lens is perfect for non-stabilized bodies like Sony A6300 because it doesn't have any kind of IBIS. But with the FX30, I did find it to be jerky. And um, just as an example, I was shooting a wedding using a monopod, so it was super stable. I was standing still, but still I was using the uh, steady shot active to get perfectly still shots. And I saw in the corners of the shot some wiggling, wobbling, uh, kind of jerky movements and so on. So this Tamron lens does not like IBIS system in my Sony FX30. You cannot use those separately. So if you turn on the stabilization in your camera, it also turns on the stabilization in the lens. Steady shot standard or steady shot active, doesn't matter. If you turn off the steady shot, it turns off completely all the stabilization at all. So no stabilization here in the lens, no stabilization in the camera. And basically, you don't get anything for extra cash, <laughs> for extra VC or vibration control with this lens. It simply doesn't work as supposed to, I guess, with the FX30. And also, Sony cameras do have better stabilization with native lenses. So imagine you use a 35mm Sony lens and a 35mm, I don't know, Viltrax lens. And you do the same movement, but you'll have much better stabilization with the Sony lens. Maybe it's a software issue and Sony does it on purpose, I'm not sure. I'm just telling you how it is and how it works. So with third-party lenses, it's not as smooth as with native lenses with Sony cameras. So all in all, I do get the same performance and you'll see it in a minute with this Sigma with no stabilization whatsoever and with this Tamron with VC. So let's have a look. So guys, here we are, the stabilization test, steady shot off with Sigma at 18 millimeters, and you can see how shaky the footage is, steady shot standard right now, it's okay, and steady shot active looks pretty much stable, uh, almost like a tripod man. So here is the Tamron with no steady shots, here it is with steady shot standard, right now, I can still see a little wobble on the corners of the shots, and with steady shot active it's much more stable, but still it's kind of floating around all the time and if we get it side by side I can tell that the Sigma with no stabilization built in does look better to me. At 50mm steady shot off with Sigma, steady shot standard, it's okay. And here it is with steady shot active, it looks really nice. And then Tamron at 50mm as well, steady shot standard, okay, steady shot active, a little jerky. So here they are side by side guys, and as you can tell, Sigma looks a tiny bit more stable. So now let's have a walk, so steady shot standard on Sigma. It is jerky, it is like all over the place. With Tamron it also does have those moments when it's like, uh, and the frame just jumps a little bit. So here it is side by side, I cannot really tell the difference. Tamron is certainly not more stable than the Sigma. With steady shot active we still get decently stable image but those little moments when the camera i mean the sensor just shifts too much and recenters itself is obvious on both lenses and i can even say that i do like the image on the sigma better in terms of stabilization i also did this like semi orbital shot with also both lenses with steady shot active and with Sony A7S III and, for instance, 35mm with no image stabilization built in, I could do this all day and it would be super smooth and really steady. The FX30 is weaker in terms of IBIS system than the A7S III for some reason, but it is what it is and I don't see a major advantage of the Tamron lens being stabilized compared to the Sigma, it's just not there. And here is the Sigma lens with Sony A6300, which is not stabilized at all. And you can see how shaky it is because of the awful rolling shutter performance on the Sony A6300. So A6300 basically does need any kind of image stabilization, because even if you try to do your best ninja walk, you'll still get a lot of rolling shutter effect and wobbly footage. So Sigma is no go, <laughs> only the gimbal or a monopod or tripod. With Tamron, it does look much better, 
with the A6300 and with stabilization turned on. So only the internal stabilization on the lens works right now. And when you start going, even with the ninja walk, you do get those wobbles. But it looks like it's more stable than on the FX30. Maybe I'm wrong. Please let me know down in the comment section below. What do you think, guys? But I can tell that Tamron does okay with the A6300, but it does maybe even worse with Sony FX30. I am not sure, <laughs> to be honest, guys. So if you plan on buying the FX30 and the Tamron lens for awesome stabilization, it won't provide you with this. So Sigma in this case is cheaper, it's smaller, it's lighter. So VC is just for the cameras that don't have uh, IBIS system. Otherwise, if you only need, extremely need, a tiny bit wider with 17 millimeters compared to 18 millimeters or those 20 millimeters on the um, tight end, on the telephoto end, which isn't a huge difference in my opinion as well, you can have a look at this Tamron. But as for now, for Sony FX30, I would more, uh, I would consider more uh, the Sigma lens. So now let's have a look at the distortion, vignette, and the sharpness of those lenses at different focal length and apertures. First of all, let's have a look at the vignette correction and the distortion correction in camera. So here is the vignette correction on and off in camera. So with the Tamron lens, of course, and here is the distortion correction off and distortion correction on on the widest end with the Tamron lens. It's a pretty big distortion, to be honest. With the Sigma lens, we also do get a lot of vignette when we turn off those in camera corrections and also the distortion. It is a barrel distortion and it's a pretty big one. So I do recommend setting your camera on uh, in terms of uh, corrections because if you shoot video or JPEGs, they will be um, they will be applied to your footage or to your JPEG photos. But if you shoot raw, you'll need to correct them in post yourself. So guys, here it is at the widest angle, 18 millimeters on Sigma and 17 millimeters on Tamron. They are both pretty straight because we have applied the in-camera corrections, of course, but they do suffer from vignettes at f2.8. So when we step down to f4, we do have much brighter corners of the image. And at f5.6, it's also getting much sharper in the corners and the vignette goes away completely. So now let's have a look at the top corner of both cameras at f2.8. It's okay, it's not extremely sharp on both, but I would say it's more than um, fine. So here it is at f4, we get much brighter corners and decent sharpness, more or less comparable as well, or comparable. I guess it's comparable. So here it is at 50 mm f2.8, we do have pretty heavy vignette, and if we stop down to f4, we get brilliant sharpness in the center of the image and also get rid of vignette in the corners. So here it is at 50 mm f2.8 at 500% scale, and I can tell that probably Tamron is a bit more sharp, but it's like in the margin of error. So all in all, I would say those two lenses perform really closely in terms of vignette, distortion, and sharpness at almost all apertures. No winner here. So let's talk chromatic aberrations at widest angles. They both have issues at uh, widest apertures, but at f4, the chromatic aberrations are reduced. At 5.6, they are almost gone completely. Those two lenses are not perfect in terms of chromatic aberrations for sure. So you have to stop down if you do get those into the shot and if they bother you at all. But all in all, I would say that the Tamron is a tiny bit better in terms of chromatic aberrations, but it's not a huge difference. I'm saying it's all day today, but it's not a huge difference between those two lenses optically, in my opinion. So now let's have a look at the bokeh. Here it is at 18mm f2.8 on the Sigma, on the widest stand, of course, and we do get pretty round bokehs with no outlining, no busyness. I do like the bokeh of this uh, lens at wide angle. And here it is with Tamron lens, 17mm f2.8. I would say it's a bit more busy, but it has 9-bladed aperture compared to 7-bladed aperture on the Sigma, but still, for some reason, I do like the Sigma's bokeh a touch more. And as you can tell, I'm wrecking focus on both lenses manually, and Tamron is steppy, steppy, steppy. I don't like this. And Sigma is much more smooth, of course. At 50mm, we do get creamy bokeh. It's 
a tiny bit busy and I would even say swirly on the Sigma at 50 millimeters. I like the swirly bokeh, of course, Helios 44.2 guys. And here it is at 50 millimeters with the Tamron lens. It's okay. It looks like a painting a little bit. It's busier. I would prefer the Sigma's bokeh at 50 millimeters, but at 70 millimeters we do get more bokeh with the Tamron lens. So if you need the most amount of bokeh, so here it is with the Tamron lens. Side by side, I wouldn't pick a winner here. They are more or less identical. Maybe Sigma is a touch better. So here I am at 50 millimeters with Tamron lens. And here is the background. I would say that this bokeh reminds me of Sony Zeiss F4 24-70 lens, which is not the best lens in terms of bokeh. And here it is with Sigma at 50. It's also okay. 70 millimeters on Tamron. I would say it's not the most beautiful bokeh I've seen, but it's okay, it's fine. And here they are side by side. Mm, I would say specular highlights look a touch better on the Tamron lens, but nothing too crazy. I see some chromatic aberrations with the Sigma in terms of bokeh. I would say you won't really notice the difference. On the Tamron at 50 millimeters right here at my right, you can see some uh, inner uh, structure in the bokeh. I will show it to you in a minute during the night test. But all in all, I would say you won't notice the difference any time, any day between those two lenses. They're so close. And uh, here is the bokeh test between those two. Sigma on the left, Tamron on the right, as always. And you can see this inner structure in the Tamron bokeh. So during the night, I would actually prefer the Sigma. And now uh, you can see that the seven bladed aperture is actually doing not that bad compared to nine bladed aperture of Tamron. And I can say it's like onion ring in the Tamron, but Sigma does look preferably better to me. And when we stop down, we do get not that round corners, especially when we get to f5.6 on the Sigma lens. But all in all, I would say, guys, mm, Sigma is a touch better because of this gross outlining with the Tamron lens, but you won't be noticing it all day, all night. Only if you shoot like against the fairy lights all the time and they are all the time in the bow case, maybe you will notice the difference. But in other cases, it's not possible. And guys, one more benefit of this tiny Sigma lens is that you can use it with small gimbals like this Moza Aircross S. And as you can tell, I can use any focal length and I can easily make some shots with this combination of FX30, Moza Aircross S and Sigma, both at 18 millimeters and 50 millimeters. Here I'm using steady shot active mode and no pulse stabilization, as you can tell. And it's more than usable if I stabilize it in post a little bit more. Maybe I'll get even better shots. And you get this versatility of using 18 millimeters and also using the 50 millimeters on the crop sensor camera without rebalancing a tiny gimbal. And the whole setup weighs less than 1.5 kilograms, which is great. So one more plus for the Sigma lens. So let's get to the conclusion, guys. So guys, it's time to conclude. To be honest, as an owner of 17 to 70 from Tamron, I would not recommend buying the Tamron lens if you use Sony FX30 or any camera which has built-in image stabilization, I mean the Sony camera, because they simply don't work well with each other and you are overpaying and over carrying some weight with the Tamron lens compared to this nifty uh, 18 to 50 lens from Sigma. So I would say if I were to buy a lens for my Sony FX30 today, I would pick the Sigma. Obviously, guys, because all of the factors I've mentioned above. But if you don't have a stabilized camera, stabilized sensor camera like Sony FX, not FX, A6300, A6400, the Tamron is definitely the way to go. The focal length are great and the stabilization does make the difference with non-stabilized cameras. But if you do have a stabilized camera A6700 or A6600 or FX30, obviously, I would pick the Sigma because it's so light, so lightweight, so compact. You will throw it in your bag even if you only use prime lenses like 99% of the time because this weighs nothing compared to this monster. Also, this lens has great minimum focus and distance that you can use as a macro lens. This lens does have pretty nice bokeh, sharp. I see a lot of good features about this lens. 
So Tamron is also not bad, but I'm so upset about this issue and I hope that Tamron and Sony will resolve this issue because why you pay extra for a stabilization if it doesn't work properly, I don't get it. So guys, please share your thoughts down in the comment section below. Which one of those two lenses would you prefer and why? And also, if you did enjoy this video, please smash the like and subscribe buttons and the notifications bell. Bell. <laughs> bell. It's been a long video, guys. I'm recording for like an hour already. So here I have a guide for APS-C crop lenses for Sony cameras. So if you do look for a lens for your APS-C camera, go ahead and watch this video next. Thank you so much for watching, guys. My name is Alek Nikitin and I'll see you around on this channel. Take care. Bye.